All right, let's start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Welcome to the South Burlington School Board meeting. And we'll start with any um, comments from the public regarding items that are not on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll move to any amendments to the agenda. We do have an amendment. We're going to remove item number 11, the private paying tuition students discussion, and we'll add that back onto future agenda items. It's not ready for that. We're also going to add in here somewhere on an update on the teacher contract negotiations. Okay, I don't know why we'd we like to do that. Why don't we put that in the 11 spot? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, great. All right, any announcements? We do have some announcements. There are some by your side. Um, one of the things I want to, I think the board has probably heard or there's information that uh, the city manager and managers have been putting out, and this is on August 14th. It's called the Municipal Leadership Conference on Education, Property Tax, and Funding Reform. Uh, it will be held at the high school uh, here in South Burlington, and it begins at 830, and it runs from 9 to 2. And so there's a series of sessions and breakout conversation, and there's hoping to be a fair uh, attendance to that. Its primary audience is, again, school, uh, primary uh, city leadership, city managers, uh, school board officials, um, and certainly uh, superintendents are also been invited. So the second page of that is, is, your, is the information regarding that. And uh, the other part is just letting you know about the Regional Vermont School Boards Association meeting for Chittenden, Grand Isle, and Franklin County is scheduled at Milton High School October 1st. And we can, again, you can add that to it. We'll, we'll remind you again on the calendar that I said that we would do I earlier. That's one of our board meetings, um, isn't it? If it's not, it's October 1st. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll look. Okay. I'm, I'm not. And that's our, that's our regional I'm meeting? So, uh, yeah, that is. So is I think it's a conflict. We need to figure that out. So we can ask. I don't know that we can get a chance to get them to reschedule that, but VSBA, we typically have gotten into this, as you know, with conflicts on Wednesdays. And uh, anyway. That was the, you were referring, Julie, to the regional meeting? Yeah, and the one that's, you know, our region yeah. is that night. I think it's also good, maybe this is just a, an, up, an opportunity for an update around um, the VSBA work, um, around the board's work on the policy governance pieces, and we identified our items of wanting to get um, to allow VSBA to host. They actually host an event with us, and they broadcast it. We were we're waiting still for um, what other boards are considering to be their kind of um, desired, you know, agenda items for that meeting. So I haven't heard back from Harry Frank, but I expect I will soon. I'll let you know that. All right. Um, and we just received a modified agenda, yeah. and I think we actually have to amend the modified agenda. So let's let's work off of the blue sheet, and we're going to take agenda item eight off. So did I not put that one on my? Oh, Sorry, I apologize for that. And were we adding feedback on form-based code? Um, I don't know that it's going to be action. Um, we'll keep it there and we'll figure out if there's action. We kept it as action, although it's yeah. not necessarily required. Yeah. But Okay, and so we're taking 12 off now, which is private paying tuition. Yeah. We're substituting that with a teacher, teacher. contract mm -hmm. update. Okay. So we'll work off the blue yep. modified agenda. All right. So that's all I have for announcements. Other than there's a lot going on, uh, I think it would be, be wrong to say we're going to get into some of the projects, but you're sitting in one of the projects. If you haven't been in the middle school cafeteria before, you notice that it's a little bit brighter. Uh, the lights are up now in the ceiling and LEDs, and uh, it's been painted. Again, there's still some <coughs> additional cleaning to do here, but again, folks have been doing a heck of a, a good job. So this is all our, our folks here. should note that we're in the 
in the cafeteria. People <laughs> wonder where we're sitting. I John. came in today, and the recreation kids were in here, the summer program, and um, the counselors had them with rooms, and, and I thanked them for cleaning up. I said there'd be <laughs> an important board meeting tonight, and uh, that they should have more fun tomorrow because of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thanks, John. All right, we'll move on to agenda item six, the city school collaboration. We've got a lot going on in this area, uh, board members and um, um, myself and city management have certainly been busy um, since the receipt of the Saxton Partners proposal, one, and then two, a whole lot going on around uh, kind of what I'm going to say, recalibrating our master planning and visioning work. Um, again, as folks know, that has always been in place for September but given some of the additional uh, information that's been coming in there's been some what I'm going to say rescoping or reevaluating uh, thinking about things of um, how best to communicate timeline etc so um, that I think you'll you'll hear a little bit more about that and I'll save that from in my report but um, I think really important to note that uh, under the master planning and visioning work, um, this is all encompassing uh, work right now between city and school. Um, in addition, I think although connected to that is the CIP and the stewardship work that Dan Fleming uh, and Chris Shaw along with John Stewart and Tom Hubbard are, are putting some work together which will be also important to the, to the process. Um, so again, I think there's there continues to be really positive conversations around how we're working and communicating collaboratively. So, City School, I don't know if you wanted anything else to add to our work. Um, no, I think we did meet this week um, and we've um, identified some potential need for um, some analytical resources um, that the city and school might collaborate with in terms of looking at various models and the impact to taxpayers and, and uh, uh, it would cover the gamut of things, including the, the um, capital improvement uh, projects on either side of the house. So um, I think we're in that stage of really scoping out what would be um, requirements where we may need to invest some extra um, so, or some additional talent and skill sets to really move that forward in a meaningful way. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Good. Any questions on that? All right, we'll move to agenda item seven, the superintendent's report. So again, outlined, as I said earlier, we have a lot of projects. I highlighted the one that we're sitting in, which is the middle school. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, again, I, I want to, um, you know, this, is, this has been a busy summer. There's a lot going on, and I certainly want to, uh, as I know you all appreciate all the good work that happens with our, with our staff, but there's also been a lot of, like, coordination. And uh, I'm going to, I'd like to ask John just to kind of walk you through some of these things. But uh, a special thanks to John is, you know, this is, these, these things come up and are added between John and Bart Maselli uh, have done just an enormous amount of work in making sure things are on target. And those of you who know, we've had a fair amount of storms that come through and anytime you're doing a roof project and you have even contractors on the roof, you know, there's worry of like, I hope they know. <laughs> and so we've been, uh, John's been really excellent on, on helping that through. So John, would you mind just kind of highlighting some of the things here? And I don't think you need to necessarily go through all of them, but maybe some of the bigger ones. Uh, no problem. As you walked in the front door today, you saw that there's a construction area and the middle school elevator is being put in. Um, mostly the, the new shaft and the unit will be outside of the current building, but it'll, it'll be part of the building. It won't be glass or anything. It'll be bricked in. And so the, the contractor's working really hard to um, seal the front off so it's safe. And I think they've done a really, really commendable job there. And to get the conference room and the teacher's um, teacher room upstairs ready for the start of school. So those are the, that's the first thing. Then in the month of September, they'll finish the outside, putting the brick up. Um, and it will be with minimal disturbance to the education process because we don't have a lot of windows in this um, area. So they can do the brick work then. And then um, the elevator itself is a long lead time, so it won't be here until November. Uh, and it'd be installed in November and December. So this is scheduled to be <coughs> functioning in by, by January 14th is the end date. 
the one the one problem that's actually developed since this report was the um, we have the design that we've approved from Dorn and Whittier was a machineless um, a, a, no machine room required in the elevator um, and the standards changed July 1st with no grace period on that so um, in other words the Vermont standards change that you need a machine room and Doran Whittier has uh, set up a, a meeting to have a variance request with the elevator safety review board on August 12th I'll get you the correspondence from that um, so that uh, that's an important meeting uh, and we'll keep you keep you posted on what that is John what does it mean a machine room what? Um, the current elevator for instance has a um, uh, it goes to the second floor, but the, over in, at the entrance of the, um, the the gymnasium, there's a special closet so where, where, the, where the hydraulics switch okay. unit, and now again newer standard are control units within the actual shaft. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. The high school roof is uh, just about completed. The ceiling, um, the ceiling, uh, final ceiling they're doing right now. And they're here a little bit early so that's been a very successful project uh, and um, boy you know when you have roofs in the rain you uh, said ceilings judgment roofs right I'm sorry yeah, yeah it's sorry. up above us yes. all right uh, the it, it, it was a great crew that we've had there so Chamberlain roof is starting tomorrow there the library is going to be re-roofed and uh, that'll be sealed up it's a smaller type of project and it'll be done in 10 days and the high school windows are when we did the testing um, of the windows as required when you dispose of windows and put new ones in uh, there was there was um, some substances there that have to be disposed of carefully and um, the risk involved to handling the material and um, being in the room right now we have extensive work on that to be reported on in August 20th um, what kind of substance? Uh, well there's um, we test for lead asbestos and PCBs okay. PCBs is what they found okay. very low level and um, so tomorrow we have a, a meeting to discuss that at length to, to say okay what does this mean to students parents and um, teachers mm -hmm. and um, how to dispose of it and ha then how to go along with the project so we, we again we have some some questions that we want to have answered around number one we, we want to replace the windows so what's the right process and as John outlined there's all kinds of things that you need to do regardless of of what you're doing whether it's tile whether it's any kind of work mm -hmm. you have to do pre and post testing so we're really diligent about that protocol um, so at this juncture we're obviously we're not in the in the position of replacing the windows but understanding how we might move forward anytime anytime soon and we certainly want to be really mindful of the types of questions what you know what do we need to do and then what are the frequently asked questions that we can that we we want answered and then make sure that there's also information that will go out to others but as John said we have a call in tomorrow three-ish or something like that um, and so I think this will be important to get all of our, you know, our questions answered. Again, we, we want to replace the, the windows, and we want to know how, how best to go about doing that. We've been working on this issue all summer and to determine the extent of the, the issue. So. Can I just ask why the windows need replacing? Well, they're the original. They're single pane windows. Yeah. Not energy efficient. Not energy efficient. And, and then I'm sure people are going to ask, why are you not reusing the elevator shaft that you have already here? No, nope, we are. Why do you move to a new spot? I don't get it. We 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 have this the current one. Actually, we spent around eighty thousand dollars getting it in working order. It doesn't meet code now. Oh gosh. And it 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 did meet code in 1969, but um, we don't still don't have a backup. Okay. And oh, you have to have a backup. Well, we should. Okay. We've had we had to reroute all programming in this school, in, not this year, but the last year for two months. Okay. So the kids could have access. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's a big ADA yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. um, 
quickly, the middle school flooring, we've talked about that brown floor upstairs. The asbestos abatement is done and the floor is halfway installed. If you look at the library ceiling and light fixtures uh, across the hall, that's being done right now and that's why we're in this room. Um, the parking lot striping, it's kind of a small project, but it'll all be done. Um, all schools, so we know parking places and arrows. And the hardest part has been to get the high school, middle school lot done. We, it's so busy here this summer. I just, it's, it's, it seems to be different than it was when I first started seven years ago. So they're going to come Friday night at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> and this cafeteria is painted, and we have floors and smaller projects at all the Orchard, Chamberlain, and Marcotte. Um, floors and ventilation in Orchard. There were some rooms there that were really hot, and there's new ventilation systems for three of those classrooms that face on the south and west. So, and there's other things, but that's enough, I think. Thank you, John. Yeah. Um, master planning and visioning, as I said earlier, is is upon us, and there's been an awful lot of time. I almost, it's been a pretty consuming amount of time the last few days um, for a lot of my staff just working through this. So I definitely owe the board kind of a, a timeline here very soon uh, that will be a draft that can be vetted, communicated, and, uh, and shared broadly. Um, so the, the other part that I wanted, there's a whole lot of information that's going to become available. I just wanted to share with you this one document that's available. I'm not going to go through it page by page. I'm just going to inform you a little bit about what the work is here. Um, what we essentially did, and I say we, but Ray, Ray Mann, our data uh, person, um, took basically all of our addresses of all of our current students and plotted them onto the Google map. And so that we can begin to have a conversation about where uh, our students are in, in the various schools and where they come from. Uh, remembering that um, Rick Marcotte Central School, as a result of AYP, students have had the opportunity to go, um, and the, the, really the only number of students have come really from Chamberlain to, to Rick Marcotte. Um, hardly anybody, I think, has come from Orchard. But that sometimes will, will deviate. There's, usually, there's two slides per school sector. The first one is just the, the raw, and then what um, Ray did for me is just put kind of a crossbar through so that then you could do the northeast quadrant um, and the percent of students that lie within that. Because again, the clusters don't necessarily tell you the numbers. But we expect to be able to use a lot of this data and import it even into different places for us uh, as we look at our master planning and visioning um, conversation. So I don't know if you have specific questions. Again, a lot of this falls on to some of the work that we did with the voting districts, uh, Martin's work that we did some time ago now, but I think it, it plays into that as well. I don't know if there's any questions about about this or ideas that you might have that would be helpful to you. Did, is the school location plotted on here? The school, uh, it's hard because it's a Google active map, mm -hmm. so it, you have to you have to zoom into it. These are active, yeah. so I'm happy to send these to you, and you can you can look at them a little bit more more in depth but if you um, actually roller bar in you know the, the it will come closer to you and you'll see the school populated the problem is the scales kind of it's it's almost too big in this yeah. form of what he made copies of so you can't you can't see the school uh, we also could move the crossbar you know um, to the area but we kind of we stayed in, in that in that similar central location just to provide clarity And say again what the crossbar is? It's, it's an arbitrary just uh, okay. establishment of letting you know so you can tell how many students are in, in the northeast quadrant of the school. But the it's, not, it's not segmented in any way that's relevant to where no. the schools are located. It's just basically anything. telling, because you can, when you, zoom, when you zoom in, you can see where community or roads are, so you yeah. can see a little bit of that density disbursement, uh, as opposed to trying to do any other kind of line. So that, that was... That was that decision. Okay. And then the last part I wanted, I don't know, any questions on that? The last part I wanted to just update, I did put in here on, on the healthcare summit. Again, there's been an effort to try to bring uh, information to our staff, all of our employees, about 
healthcare and information that's or things that are happening uh, within the healthcare and also be able to answer questions of our employees, um, all of our employees, whether they're teachers, support staff, um, uh, et cetera. And so that was scheduled, and as I allude to here, uh, it was planned and then canceled due to low enrollment. And you know, I want to just be clear with the board, there was some very clear intentions of the board to try to get out um, uh, really clear information about um, objectives of this. Of this. And, um, unfortunately, you know, that has not been carried out. And so I am very aware that we're going to try to get that rescheduled mm -hmm. and that um, we get that as soon as possible uh, with appropriate notice and that we look at ways in which we can also share information with folks who can't attend mm -hmm. um, and that we have, again, uh, notification well in advance of that. So. Again, that's something that did not happen, and I take responsibility for that not happening. And um, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to just update folks on. I don't know if there's any questions from the board um, regarding that. Um, I know we had talked about kind of having a plan in place by the next meeting, mm -hmm. and we may be modifying the meeting date, correct. but I assume that would pull true whenever the meeting that's occurs. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, uh, just so the public knows, we currently have on the the next board meeting was the 20th and it appears that that's going to change for everyone to the 27th so uh, that next meeting would be the 27th and I don't believe the only reason I reserve a board member is that all works but I need to make sure that it's there's no other challenges on the calendar and we'll send out that tomorrow okay all right Unless there's questions, we'll move on to agenda item nine. This is feedback on form-based code. Yeah, so um, again, as you know, some time ago, we have been in the providing feedback, and Martin has been an active member on the form-based code committee that's at the city. And again, remember that the form-based code primarily is a conversation that's been happening in city center, which is in part connected to master planning and visioning. But in addition, the, the school district also had conversations around safety zones. And so the conversation of melding these two together and making sure form-based codes, the form-based code language was consistent with what we wanted. And so we asked uh, Sean Tuohy, our attorney, to take a look at uh, and provide us with some feedback of which he's done. And I know Martin's had a chance to have a conversation with him. I've had a brief conversation with him. So why don't I just turn it over to Martin and sure. allow him to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, yes, the, um, right now the status of the form-based code, which is for a defined uh, area in city center, uh, which includes Central School, uh, it's before the Planning Commission, and they're seeking uh, public comment <clears throat> by August 5th, and we have to decide what, if any, public, what, if, what, if any comment we want to uh, give to the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, but I did have a chance to speak uh, with Sean, and I did have a chance to go over some information he sent me. And I'm going to try to keep this at a level that I understand, so maybe then everybody else will understand it, <clears throat> because this is delving into zoning law. But I, I think it's important for, for everybody to, to get a basic idea of, of the uh, potential impacts to the school district of the proposed changes to the form-based code. Uh, presently, the way... Our, the way that we can develop or the way that we can modify our, our school buildings or expand um, or uh, build a new building uh, will potentially be changed uh, as far as oversight by the Development Review Board. Uh, currently, there are uh, areas zoned for mun municipal use. That includes the high school the middle school, the elementary schools, and across the street uh, over in the city offices. And if uh, we were to build a school or modify school in those zones, currently it uh, would not have to go before the Development Review Board, is my understanding. Um, it, it's, it's exempted from, it's not a conditional use, one can just proceed uh, with um, the development. Uh, <clears throat> the way that and of course, Paul Connor could tell me that I'm wrong about all this, um, and maybe we'll find that out. There still would be permitting required, but there, there mean, may be but permitting required, but it's like not conditional use. Right. It's it's pretty straightforward to, yeah. 
You mean on our existing property? Yes, on the, what's been zoned as municipal use. Okay. There is a, a question of whether if the, if the school were to purchase other property elsewhere, would that become property zoned for municipal use? That, that's not really dealt with in, in this uh, regulation at this point, and that's a question that I have for Paul Connor. But in any event, uh, the new zone uh, zoning, form-based code uh, zoning regulations would act a little bit differently. Uh, if there's going to be a new school, presumably, the way it seems to be written, is that it would have to comply uh, with uh, the form-based code zones uh, zoning or seek exceptions from the Development Review Board. Is that specific to the city center area? No, well, that's a little bit different. This is just kind of a general. Uh, if, if the, the concept is that these, these uh, codes may expand for the whole of the city. Okay. And that's actually where that becomes more important. If sometime down the road the, we want to build a new school somewhere, uh, uh, the question is, well, what, what, what will the new regs require? Uh, as for right now and as for Central School and that particular area, uh, it is accepted from any of the standards. So we could proceed with modifying, expanding Central School in any manner, and there wouldn't really be any oversight as far as Sean or I can tell. I mean, we'd be able to, to do that. So, um, but to the extent that a new school might be built, some, you know, I'm not suggesting anytime soon, but I mean, at some point, if a new school is going to be built, uh, there are some questions about how much oversight the DRB would have that they haven't had before. Now, having said all that, I don't know if that's a concern necessarily or not, because the DRB oversight in the context of the form based code is fairly narrow, and it's looking at whether there are appropriate exceptions to the forms of the buildings that are supposed to be in these different areas. So I, I'm not sure whether we really have an objection at this point. And really if it's even the time we, if it's the time to bring an objection because it doesn't apply to central school because mm -hmm. that's accepted. Um, and I don't believe, now I guess the one question would be whether uh, the district would be planning within you know, before these uh, codes expand beyond city center, uh, whether we'd be planning on building a new building within the city center. That seems just completely unlikely, so I don't see that as a concern. Yeah, I think so. what you're, one of the things you're bringing up, Martin, is <clears throat> basically all of our facilities are 50 years old at this right. point, or more or less, and we haven't had the experience of, of having to comply or, or even having a discussion about a new a new facility or even significant modifications or development within existing facilities yeah. that, that would require any kind of um, interface with the DRB. Right. So I, I don't think we have, yeah, we don't have any experience in that. And um, and there, there is the outstanding question, and, and maybe we just don't have to resolve it for this step of form-based codes because it doesn't seem like it's it's a, a chance that we're going to run into that as a problem, <clears throat> but we just need to make sure that we have this flag for the next stage and uh, looking very carefully at that. Um, but I will, I will leave you with what, what Sean uh, Tui has, has provided. You know, some of it might have uh, some attorney-client privileged information within it, so we're not going to uh, at least publicize it uh, yet. I mean, uh, but he discusses that bit a little bit uh, as well. Um, the, the second part of is the school safety zone and, and that the form-based codes as written now do not have the school safety zone within them. Uh, and uh, the question is whether we should provide a public or a comment during this public comment period uh, re-emphasizing uh, that a school safety zone should be put in place. Uh, in advance of the form based codes being enacted or passed on by the Planning Commission. And I know that David, you forwarded or told Paul Connor and the folks that the uh, opinion of the Supreme Court has come out, which was one of the one of the things they wanted to see before they proceeded. Correct. Have you heard back as far as what? No, as far as I know, they're they're moving forward with again they're they're having the hearing uh, public hearing period that ends August. 
fifth, fifth or fourth, and um, making a decision. I think they, they wanted to make sure that the, there was a decision either way before they set that date and target. Yeah, I guess I, I'm just um, trying, I'm not exactly sure. Well, we could, we could certainly submit uh, essentially what we have submitted before and ask them to reconsider or look at this uh, again um, regarding the safety, school safety zone. I, I guess I'd like to kind of get the read of everybody else and what we should do. So, I mean, it seems like the alternatives are during this public hearing session before the 5th, it's we do nothing or we reinforce the board's opinion on the need for a school, need for school safety zones as indicated. Right. Well, the comments? Not, in fact, been, uh, recognized in the, what's being put on the table for comment, I think we should restate our position on it and just make sure it doesn't uh, get forgotten. Should, it, should I work with David in the next couple of days? And I don't know that it has to be extensive because we've already written up all of our mm -hmm. <coughs> our rationales for what we provided. So can um, I ask one other question? So if the if the school property is considered municipal and that doesn't go under the authority of the DRB, if the school were to purchase an adjacent property to our current property, would we still be? That, that's a, I don't know the answer to okay. that, whether Purchases. that would be considered a municipal use. Mm -hmm. And timing-wise, more likely than not, if this train keeps on going down the track, their form-based code or some form of a new zoning regulation will cover all the city okay. anyway. So, uh, I mean, that's the thing that we have to watch. And, and I guess the other thing, I, I would suggest that I sit down with Paul Connor and go over a little more in depth than what I just mm -hmm. talked about regarding municipal use versus exceptions, etc., mm -hmm. uh, to to make sure that we shouldn't be providing comment. Uh, but the question is, if he says, "Well, yeah, you do have a legitimate concern," should I go ahead through David and provide? I mean, provide that comment to the planning commission because we're not going to have a board meeting in advance of that. I, uh, do you trust me to figure out whether we should uh, provide any additional comments or well, should it's, be it somehow? sounds like we would want to ask that question even though we haven't had to ask that question in 50 years but, right, uh, right. but we'd want to know that in the event and ba basically it would be any school use would be exempted as a municipal use right on a going forward basis right. so I, I think it's worth asking the question and if Paul indicates it it is a legitimate concern. I think it should be included in our, our reinforcing our position on the safety zones. Then. Is, is everyone all right with that? I don't think we need action on it, but. Yeah, so it's establishing, or providing maybe public testimony or whatever on this safety zone, and then looking at the exemption for, or what would be the condition, the use if we were to purchase land. So is there a specific meeting that Public, is public comment being received in a written fashion, or is there a meeting that we should plan to be in attendance? Um, I think it's been, uh, in my mind, it has, in, as I've understood, it's been in writing. Okay. I mean, that's been through the form-based code. There probably have been meetings, but we're, we, the form-based code committee has been meeting to also provide comments <coughs> to the uh, planning commission by the 5th of August. So. Um, I think it would be in writing. I think that's, I, I wasn't planning on attending the meeting, although that David was either. I, I think they've been having both. They have a public comment period that where you submit, and then you can, they also have had their meetings, and they have a place in there where you can be rendering your public comment that way for those that don't want to write it. Okay. Right. Sounds like we've got consensus Thank on you, response. All right, so I'll <coughs> talk with David in the next yeah. couple of days to put something together. All right, we'll move on to agenda item 10, uh, administrative report on nutritional services. So we're going to turn it over to, to Rhonda Kirtner, who's here joining us tonight in, in the bright cafeteria where she no, works so eloquently. All I need is the couches, the music, and the <laughs> well, let's not get Let's not get too far out of that. You said I could be part of this. <laughs> and, and John, obviously, uh, Stuart, who 
as you know, has also been, his office has worked also with Rhonda Suspir specifically around kind of uh, the financial oversight, which was some of the things and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, proactive targeting and a lot of the good work. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to, to Rhonda. Thank well, you. Well, the good news is on the front page. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we, had a, we had a good year. Um, it wasn't without challenges. Um, we did struggle, but in the end, um, John was right. I remember I said it was going to be 8,000, and John said, well, it would be 20,000 to the good or 20,000 to the bad. So he was closer. I had to give him that. He, he's the money guy. So um, sales were up uh, district wide across the board. Um, I gave you percentages. We, we didn't want to bore you with the graphs. We'll get in more detail in the next one. But uh, the adult breakfast participation uh, basically went from 79 to two, uh, 2,344. Uh, adult lunches were 197 percent. That's 5,100 meals uh, over the year. Student breakfasts were up uh, 51 percent, or 18,550 breakfasts, more than what we served the year before. Uh, and lunches were up uh, 11 percent, or 21,000 meals. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the breakfast is that even though it was up 51 percent, when we went through our state review, they said, your breakfast numbers are horrible. I said, but they're 51% less horrible than they were last year. <laughs> so um, we still have a really long way to go in breakfast. Um, so we're going we're gonna to work on that. Um, so uh, we increased the number of meals per labor hour, I think, to a, a really workable level. Um, I, I used the information uh, that was given to the board when Steve Marianelli and the external think tank and internal got together. Um, and I redid the labor hours that we're now currently district-wide at 13.36. Um, so we're at a really good place, but we're looking to get, you know, even higher. Um, we, we ended up with an unaudited uh, profit um, of $20,541. Um, so I think that was pretty good. Uh, we had four less days of school. Those four snow days would have brought us up a little bit, right, John? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and nutritional services also this year uh, absorbed the cost of all of the chemicals um, in the kitchen as we feel we should. Um, so, you know, that's a couple of thousand dollars. Um, some other things that we did that I didn't put on here, which I think uh, we don't know the actual numbers yet, but will have a significant impact on energy savings. The inventory came so low at the end of the year, we closed down all of the, ref all of the freezers in the district except for one. And that freezer is only a quarter full. Uh, so there is nothing running at the high school that is drawing electricity and the only thing that's running here is the big freezer and I did have the walk-in turn back on but um, right up until last week we were using a double door refrigerator um, to keep stuff that we needed so we're also looking at partnering with other departments and trying to be conscientious of the resources that we use that we're not charged for and I'm going to be interested to see what Bart finds out about the electric component. Of course, this year, you know, we've got all this major construction going on, but I still expect that we would be able to see some savings, and Bart, Bart thinks so as well. So those are, those are things that we're trying to be conscious of as well, not just, uh, you know, meeting our, our needs, but also trying to work with the district and keep the costs down associated with running our department. Um, so that being said, page two <laughs> gives us the challenges uh, for next year. Commodity entitlement decreased $12,000 um, over what we were uh, entitled to last year. The reason for that is entitlement is determined from the prior full year's lunch sales only. So when I order the commodities, I order the commodities that we will be using this year in April. So we won't reap the benefits of the increased meal participation until next year, which is unfortunate. Um, because you had a dip in sales the year before I came, so now we're forced to kind of live within that constraint. So that, that's $12,000 that we don't have accessible uh, to us in commodity foods, but I, I think we can work with that. Um, the USDA guidelines, um, they're not really budging a lot on them. They are going to all grains must be whole grain rich. Um, and the only thing that I have heard is they may possibly allow some waivers for a school district that can prove that they're losing money um, carrying whole grain pastas, uh, they might allow you to do, go back to white. But we didn't lose money, 
and I don't want to lose money for six months so that we can serve white pasta again. So we're going to find a way around that too. So, but just to give you an idea, but a lot of the, this is the last and the last big phase. There's two major years, the year before last and this year. If we can make it through this year and break even or make a slight profit, then I think we will be set up for the future to continue being part of, of this program. Um, and, and we're coming up with some creative ways to try to, to keep our sales um, where they are. Um, healthcare premiums uh, are going up 4.5%. We obviously, so we have to take that in consideration. Um, the good thing about being frugal is that you spend less money on what on your food, but the bad thing is, is that we lost a percent um, in rebates on the purchases uh, because we didn't hit the $400,000 mark. So uh, I've talked to Reinhardt. They're willing to maybe give us a little bit of uh, a leeway and keep, keep the 7.25% for the first six months to see if our spending goes back up. So they're willing to work with us um, on that. Uh, Oh, the new professional standards uh, to get the training done this year. Uh, we were looking at using um, SNA and uh, the Summer Institute, where each class costs you know twenty to eighty dollars per participant. Then driving from here to St. John's Barry, and then the labor hours, it was going to cost us a lot of money. Uh, we've done some research online uh, through the National Food Service Management Institute. I find out all the resources that they're probably using to teach those classes over there, I have access to, and PowerPoints and handbooks, so we'll be able to train the staff here, and, and we'll get the training done, it'll be accredited, so that we'll get, um, we'll have proof, they'll get certificates, and we'll meet the requirements, and only have to spend um, the labor hours to have them here in the training. So I, that, that could cut that down to, you know, just like, couple thousand dollars so uh, we are looking at ways to try to to get through these without having to spend a lot um, the smart snacks in schools I still haven't figured out to be totally honest with you uh, I hope to gain some insight on that uh, when I go to the summer Institute a lot of the stuff that we carried last year we just can't they don't meet the requirements so uh, you know and that affects our a la carte sales which is about hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year uh, so we're, we're still formulating a plan for that. Um, and instead of trying to compete with the vending machine that's right next to ours that's full of candy, uh, I think we're gonna try to do something different and unique um, and entice the kids to want to buy the stuff that we have. Because a candy bar is good, but zucchini bread or banana bread might be better. So we're, instead of trying to fight you know, they got the real cheese, it's we got the whole grain. We're gonna try to find a different way to try to keep some of those sales. But it's gonna, it's, it's going to be, the a la carte sales at the high school are, are going to be difficult for us next year. Um, and uh, if you get a chance, try one of the cookies. I really wanna know what you think. Cause cookies are big at the high school. We sell a lot of them. And we took a recipe and made it meet the new snack requirements using whole grain flour and less sugar. And I'm, I brought, I was hoping you guys would try them and let us know what you think. Yeah, a lot, a lot of it is the kids, but the hard part is, is if you, if you have to take something away from them, telling them that, you know, it's not our fault, it's the USDA, they really don't care. They're not getting their cookie. You know, they don't care. So what we're trying to do is put this all in a positive light by not focusing on the things they can't have, like the Ditzler's pretzels, um, and try to maybe give them stuff that would be more exciting to them. Um, or something different to kind of take that away. I, we'll just we'll have to see we'll have to see how it goes. We got our fingers crossed, and we found a pretzel machine, so we're psyched about that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. So at grant wise, um, I'm hoping to get a grant. We applied for one uh, from the USDA for a farm to school grant uh, for ninety eight thousand um, dollars, and that is for equipment and also to hopefully bring back a farm to school coordinator uh, at a district level. Right now I'm wearing both hats and it's really getting difficult. Um, you know, the farm to school movement is huge. Everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. We have great programs here in South Burlington already established at all schools. There's just no coordination. And um, just getting the answers to who's in charge of the gardens was really difficult. 
Uh, so, you know, my goal is, is to have nutritional services be part of promoting uh, the farm to school movement because it's, it's community curriculum and cafeteria, you know, the, the classroom. Those three C's make up the farm to school. And this is the largest classroom in any school, the cafeteria. And I think we have a lot to teach the kids, but I can't wear both hats um, much longer than this year. It's really important that we have somebody that is going to be, you know, handling the classroom part of it and, and the community part of it, and I can work with them on the cafeteria part of it. So those are things we're working on. Any questions? Yeah, I have one. I'm not sure. sure. Which of you I should be addressing this to, but I know over the past couple of years there's been an effort to sweep all the expenses associated with the enterprise into the enterprise. Uh -huh. And I see there's evidence that that's been happening. Uh, do you think it's now complete uh, at this point in the game? or we, It's defined. It's defined. By that I mean if Rhonda wasn't here and we didn't have our own nutritional services program, <laughs> we still have a requirement to feed the kids. And if, if yeah. it was outside, we'd still have to have equipment, electricity, that kind of thing. So that is district. But um, workers' comp, retirement, all the benefits that were, I, um, maybe they were flipped back and forth over the years, but um, they're all accounted for here. Within the enterprise, though? No? That's right. But we're not charging a percentage of electricity costs. No. Like right. So why are the chemicals being charged here? You want to know? That was my fault. Okay. Because I didn't realize I had to build them. I'm like, what do you mean i got to build them? And we'd already done everything. And I said, you know, the chemicals for cleaning the dishes, as long as it's an in-house program, really should come out of us. Mm -hmm. It really should. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can get away with that. And, and we can actually, you know, I don't know if you had an outside company if you would have to pay for the chemicals to clean up or not. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's between two and $3,000 a year. We hope to actually lower that cost um, in working with BART. But I figured if we can absorb that cost and still show, you know, a positive, then I think that's where it really should be. Okay. And also because we didn't want to redo it because I screwed up. <laughs> so I'm like, well, you know, I didn't bill it, so I might as well just pay for it this year. So, but after we talked about it, we decided that maybe that's something that we need to look at. Okay. Um, the, the problem that you get into is when you start assigning costs to the nutritional services program, you're going to have the state watching you like a hawk. Uh, because they want to make sure that you're being fair and that the program funds are used to feed the children, not to pay for utilities. So that's a really sketchy area. Oh, they're terrible about it. They're, they're really bad. Uh, so, but those are things that you know, we, can, we can look at, but we still have a long way to go if you want me to pay back that deficit. But if you'd like to just forgive it, I would be so happy oh. if you guys just wanted to pay that and then we can no. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, the one thing I did forget to update you on is the grant that we got last year we used for equipment. It was $36,000. We purchased the equipment. It didn't come in in a timely fashion to get it in during the school year, but it's all at the schools waiting to be hooked up. So the elementary schools will now be producing 98% of their food right there during batch cooking. So we're going to keep the van this year. Uh, we didn't purchase a new one. I told John I don't feel that there's a need to put money into that for our uses. We can get another year out of it and see where we're at. Uh, we still have to transport some stuff because commodities can only come to one location. And then we'll have to take it, you know, like if they need a case of cheese or whatever, we can't they won't deliver it just to that school. It all comes here or the high school, and then we have to you know, distribute it. But we'll even look at whether or not we need to continue to run a service where the van takes food to these places every day. Um, that's you know, something that we're, we're kind of looking at. Um, but we really needed two years to really see how that, how that goes. So, uh, and they, instead of getting kettles, they got tilt skillets, which is state-of-the-art bracing pans, and anything can be done in it. Um, they're really nice pieces of equipment and any, you know, schools, other schools were like, how'd you get those? I said, I got a grant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that, that's something that we look forward to is, is having 
um, the staff members then be trained on how to use that equipment and how to produce the food um, you know, there on site, which is another reason for our cycle menus, not only to control costs, but to help. Once they've gone through that six-week cycle, it should be easier the next time when they go through to prepare it. So. Rhonda, I had a question on, you made a comment about the breakfast being kind of a um, not considered very good participation from outside, but an improvement for us. Yes. I, I'm, I'm curious as to why it's a, um, why there's even an expectation that schools would have a significant um, participation level at all for student breakfast. You know, I, I wondered that too. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's they're trying to drive their program and basically saying, you know, if, you're, if you have a struggling program, then this is where you have, you know, where you can gain revenue is in the breakfast area. This is your weakest numbers. Uh, I think they just kind of have the same statements they use for every district regardless of the district circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if you are talking to a district that has 50% free and reduced, you want those children eating breakfast mm -hmm. because pretty much they're probably not getting it before they get to school. They're probably not. Um, and research shows that at the middle and high school level, only 30% of the kids actually eat prior to coming to school. So there's 70% of those kids that are going into those classrooms that aren't being fed. So, you know, I, I would like to see my goal for our district, I think, is a very reasonable goal. It may not meet the expectations of the state, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to meet the needs of the kids here in the district and meet our needs. Is I feel that we should be getting at least 100% of our free and reduced population. So if our free and reduced percentage district-wide is 18%, my breakfast numbers at the end of the year should be 18% or a little bit higher. Because we do have people that pay for breakfast. We have kids that come in and pay for breakfast. But we have some challenges here. Um, you know, at the elementary school, but kids sit on the buses sometimes for 15 minutes. They can't go into the school before a certain time. Mm -hmm. That's time that they could get off the buses and eat breakfast. Um, every school has different challenges. Here we have the same thing. If the buses run late at the elementary schools, they run late here too. The kids won't come into the classroom. So we're going to move breakfast to, to the main entryway. They, they won't come into the cafeteria. Yeah. Right. They, 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 they're, oh, we're late. We've got to go to TA. Um, I've talked with Paul and Karsten, uh, a couple of the teachers. Uh, we're going to extend breakfast hours here at the middle school. And, and that way, and we'll move breakfast out there. We'll keep breakfast for an extra half an hour. So if the buses run late, as they're running through the lobby, they can grab what they need and go. And instead of getting up there and saying, well, you know, they don't want to ask to come back down. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem with sixth and seventh graders are here. Eighth graders are in the hall, you know, so they have to. There's some dynamics that need to be changed at all the schools. Um, and at the high school, it's just a matter of changing what we offer because they have the face time over there, which is perfect. Those kids that eat first thing in the morning come in for breakfast. The other kids that, you know, a lot of kids don't want to eat until an hour or two hours after they've gotten up. So that's, you know, the face time allows them that opportunity. But if we offer some different things besides just breakfast sandwiches every day, uh, then I think we'll be able to drive the numbers. But again, I would be happy if we were, you know, if we were 20% district-wide for breakfast. Uh, if anything higher than that, I would be exceptionally happy with. But, but their expectation is just based on trying to make sure they need to justify their program. They really honestly do. And like they said, you're here anyway at that hour. You might as well make as much profit as you can during those labor hours, which does make sense. We're here preparing lunch, so um, we might as well try to you know, be available for breakfast. So we are going to work on the breakfast participation. I have one other question for you. Yes. Um, you suggested that you run into some competition with vending machines that sell chocolate bars and real Cheetos and all that. Is that here and at the high school? And I guess I thought that those vending machines were not available during school hours. Am I wrong about that? You would think that. <laughs> They're, they're supposed to be off. The, the, this one is off. The one at the high school turns on at like a 120 in the afternoon. I mean, it's and it's on. It's on in the morning. The new the new USDA requirements say that from midnight to a half an hour after the last bell, those kids can't have access to that stuff at all. There's really clear guidelines about right. you can't have compete, and so right. those uh, vending machines are supposed to be on timers. They are. They come on at 120. So let me ask you, well, <laughs> turns I, it just on. a different huh? question. The why, people that own the machine turn it on? Why are they, they program it and it comes on. Oh, like again, part of the conversation yeah. is what we do going forward around providing 
again, we have vending machines. There's, we can, we can take them out. This and in many ways are connected. And I don't know exactly if we tried to get those healthier, working with the boosters, uh, right? Uh, are, well, actually, I, I didn't do anything as far as trying to do the healthier thing. I explained to them the rules that are coming down the road, yeah. that it would not necessarily, it wouldn't affect anything if they didn't turn on until half an hour after school. Um, what concerns me the most is that we're really sending a mixed message. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That right next to a vending machine that we're trying, you know, and the thing is we don't make a lot of profit off the vending machines and I was actually considering just pulling them. But I think that would be irresponsible because we're not in this business for a profit. I'm trying very hard to, you know, make a little bit or break even. But really it's about the kids and if I pull those vending machines because we're not making money, then I think that's irresponsible because my job is to make sure that we're trying to offer them stuff that is better for them than what they can get here. But I, I really think that when we are redoing our wellness policy to also meet compliance, that we really need to decide as a district what is important to us. And, and you know, are, are we gonna allow that stuff? Um, are we gonna allow people to profit off stuff that we're not going to sell ourselves. That we're not going to sell ourselves. I well, guess. I mean, how, how can we proceed? And I mean, I think it's well, at this. I mean, it, and maybe it's made sense in the past, but having that those kind of vending machines in the schools is completely contradictory to our wellness policies, yeah. and it shouldn't be there. And there are options now. There are vending machines that have completely healthy snacks that yeah. that are being vended in South Burlington. Right. Well, again, I think that it, this, it's an, I mean, we've made, we've made some grounds on vending machines in schools, um, and we've worked hard with the boosters, although oh, still absolutely. not hard enough, to make them healthier, one. We do need to, there's always, you know, to what level do you want to go? You know, uh, at voting time and around the elementary schools, there's bake sales. Mm -hmm. And bake sales, you know, by moms and dads and folks that bring things in, we don't, you know, that goes against it as well. So to, we have to, to, to what that extent, well. that's right. And so part of our work ahead is, you know, can we post up healthy uh, snacks or snacks you can purchase? Well, and I think, you know, importantly is around, you know, what we're, you know, our, our concession stands and things of that nature. Although the focus here is right around the, you know, this location where we serve, we want to make sure kids are having healthy options, right? right? right. So. Well, it seems, I mean, bake sales are a different category than having a vending machine selling processed foods, uh, particularly in next to a vending machine that has health That isn't foods. right. And, and that, that those vending machines, I understand that they help fund, you know, the boosters and such, but, but that also seems to be contradictory to what the boosters are about. Right. I don't, I, I think know, it that, should be looked into, but. Exactly. We, we, well, we are in the process. We have another, uh, our, our, um, as Rhonda said, our committee that we'll be looking at, you know, all of our, our practices are, is, is new for an update and a re-meeting. Our PATH wellness stuff that does staff things as well is connected to that. So we, and, we and definitely know And I think know we'll find a happy medium because, you know, like for me, the, the, I was thinking of pulling them out because really it's not worth it, but I feel I have to have it. And when I was talking to the boosters last year, they said the same thing. We don't make that much off them. So, so, so I guess the thing is, is somewhere between the two of us, we can decide yeah. how are we going to do this. And maybe one of us needs to let go and the other one needs to take over. And we need to figure out, you know, who that's going to be. There'll be a compromise. But we just, that's something that we really need to step up. We're not going to get reviewed again for another three years. But I guarantee you that that will come up because that's one of the new things this year, along with the wellness policy. But Rana, so you've done some other good things with the boosters, particularly like oh. with the concession stand, with yes. some of the things they offer during mm -hmm. activities and events. You brought some good knowledge into the, the boosters and even oh, yeah. it's a, we, with a We'll definitely aid. work together yeah. to make it better, yeah. definitely. Because so I think the, the reason a lot of the stuff that they carry at the, even at the snack areas is because of convenience. I mean, nobody has time to go out and make homemade chili and do this and do that every single time. But as a parent, I remember when my kids were playing sports and I was coaching, I'm like, oh, it's hot dogs again for dinner. And I would have just killed to have chili or a homemade soup or a, a sandwich. I mean, we had leftover sandwiches and chili one day and we gave, we said, here, it's either that or it's going into the dumpster. I'd rather have you sell it. And people were like, wow, 
you know, we're going to a football game and we don't have to eat a hot dog or nachos. So, so you know, I think somewhere it, it's going to be a growing process, and, and I think that we'll get ourselves in line and, and helping each other and, and getting where we need to be as a district. Thank you, Rhonda. One quick thing. I always bring this up. It's, it's always the timing. Rhonda worked really hard to get this report done last week. Friday afternoon, my office is closed for cleaning. I'm working in the super's office. It's nice to have you there. And the nutritional <laughs> services audit from or the review from the state from, came in Friday. So you have your report, um, and Ron is working to address that in, in our um, 2.4, we'll, we'll get that to you, but it's the way it works. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to agenda item number 11, and we'll start with uh, 3.2 accountability. You're on the blue agenda. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Julie was looking. Okay. Okay. Stay, on, Stay on the blue agenda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we'll start it with 3.2 accountability to the superintendent. And um, the board has had an opportunity uh, to um, provide feedback to David uh, based on um, last year's objectives and, and uh, the ENDS monitoring um, status and so forth. And uh, over the past actually probably a couple months and David's had an opportunity to, to provide feedback to the board as well um, and at this point um, we're at a, uh, we're um, proposing a couple of different things and um, first off is there was um, merit pay uh, with your last year's compensation linked to um, effective delegation as well as you know, developing um, metrics to monitor ends and the board is um, looking to recommend that the merit pay be paid out at $3,000. Um, and uh, we're also looking at for next year, we're looking at a um, increase to your base of 2.75% effective July 1st of this year. We're looking at uh, merit pay of $4,000 that would be linked to three areas. The first would be um, continued improvement on ENDS monitoring. We, this is an area that has had a lot of attention the past uh, really 24 months, if not longer, and it's an area that I think in a lot of our conversation, David, we've, we really need to make sure we're developing metrics um, and a baseline off of which we can improve. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. The second area is really around the master planning and visioning and I don't think there's any expectation that this is something that you can do alone but we're really looking for your leadership in organizing the right team of experts to develop viable strategic and financial options for master planning and visioning which incorporate broad stakeholder feedback and result in timely and detailed recommendations to take to the community um, and then lastly would also like some periodic updates um, on your own professional development and, and um, any work uh, that you may be doing with executive coaches and so forth. Um, we would also would like to propose a $3,000 contribution to a 401k which is consistent with your total compensation package in the past. And I think that covers um, the elements of the board's discussion and, uh, and, and you've been provided with specific written feedback as well. Um, and I guess I would also say we appreciate all your hard work, your efforts. It's a privilege to work with you. Um, your leadership is is great. Your work ethic is unparalleled, <laughs> and uh, the district's really privileged to have you in, on board in this role. Well, I appreciate the feedback, and I certainly wouldn't be successful if I didn't have a really strong team behind me. And uh, you know, I look to the people in the central office and all the staff, you know, associated with pulling off the services to provided excellent education to our students and certainly to you the board and the work that you do um, pretty much on a volunteer basis around continuing to keep our district uh, you know a, a place that it has become and we want it to continue so I appreciate the feedback and it is uh, as I've said to the board it's it's um, a very evolving job you don't really know what you're going to be working on from one day to the next um, I think sometimes people who try to follow along some of the things that are happening in our office you know if they aren't aware of it, their heads will quickly spin, <laughs> spin, you know. And so how we manage that 
um, is, is, a, is a task that I'm continuing to work at, getting better at. So again, I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate working for this community. Thank you. So with that, do I have a motion to approve the compensation package as I outlined? Yes, I'll make, I'll make the motion that the board approve the uh, compensation package as you've just outlined. I'll second the motion. Is there any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion passes, and I will uh, write this update and get this to you and to the business office. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. 2.3, treatment of community. So 2.3 is in your packet. Um, I don't know specifically. There's been, I, I do want to make, uh, I'm on, my new, I'm on my new year of apology already <laughs> on the questions. The questions came out late to you. Uh, they probably arrived at you, you know, 4 o'clock this afternoon, and they're in front of you. And some of you had questions related to some of these, and I apologize for not uh, getting these to you earlier. So um, questions. Yeah, I, I did have a couple of questions yeah, I did. that uh, you did answer, and... I, with the answers that you provided regarding uh, community involvement and visioning was one of my questions related to uh, this particular monitoring report. Uh, the other question had to do with uh, the use of the survey data uh, that we've collected on the that you've collected uh, in the uh, report. It talks about data from surveys uh, will be used to inform and enhance learning and processes where necessary. Uh, you said that the survey was done last fall and that the ITE staff uh, used the data to work directly with teachers and students at the middle and high school. It sounds like it was primarily with respect to the one-to-one -one program. Was there I, I think other you, things that were done based on the data? And I'll allow Stuart to give me some, an update too. But I mean, one of the things, again, that survey information was critical in, in moving forward around what we needed to do for professional development along with kind of the ongoing planning of professional development. And our ITE staff, uh, under Stewart's direction, have we're, we're diligent in planning out the professional development activities as a result of the information that came back. But Stewart, would you? Well, this particular survey that cited in the evidence was one to one, and it basically okay. was used, you know, for one to one, not just with eighth and ninth graders, but through seven and eleven. Because just because you do eighth and ninth graders doesn't mean that's the only mm -hmm. people who would answer in that way. We did do another survey in April um, that's not cited in this report because we haven't had a chance really to collate the data yet, which we will be getting to you, which are on those bigger questions on that every other year's survey we do around some of the questions related to how we're doing on ends and other issues within the district. That's not cited in the evidence here. But safe to say a lot of the professional development specific to the one-to-one -one or for our teachers, both our ITE staff right. were engaged pretty much all year and actually even into the summer with some of the uh, professional development outline Yeah, we just, came back. we just did some work um, with elementary and uh, middle school uh, people on the, some of the work we're going to be doing Chromebooks and on Google Schools, which is expanding their... Uh, right, and the, I, I guess and the idea with this is, is getting input from, from the community, including teachers, not, not, not teachers, but parents uh, and, and other on the ongoing so revisiting those same members um, but I guess uh, what I would just as a comment for, for future mm -hmm. uh, renditions of this uh, monitoring report those kind of details are helpful I, I, I think it's fine this time because you've provided the details although they're in this answers to these questions could be uh, and actually I would also one of the questions I had was um, regarding the opportunity for feedback mm -hmm. or process and you explained that the district keeps a record of the feedback and I asked about that record and you said that you will provide that yes. data. Uh, I, I will note that you did provide that data in the April mm -hmm. April uh, monitoring report right. on parents so that mm -hmm. that data is there yep. uh, and I, I'm only saying that because given that I think that at least from my opinion uh, that the evidence is fine uh, related to, to compliance. Uh, now that you've filled in those couple questions that I had.
Any other questions or comments on 2.3, treatment of community? My only comments were around the feedback. And just you know, kind of, you know, there's, it's, the logs are kept, and you know, is, I just wondered if there would ever be time to sort of do a general report out on feedback. what that feedback is like, and you know, so that sure. we can grow as a district. And you know, are there trends in the kind of feedback that we might get from the community? But well, there's definitely. So we do have the data. We do keep track of it. And we absolutely can report out on kind of what's happening. I think there's a larger need though around um, doing a better job, and this will be part of some of the things we'll talk about around communicating, providing information updating our website, you know, allowing for feedback in a different way. So we, ha we have a, a, a need for a, no a new step. Um, we have a lot of things going on and we don't want to have people saying, hey, I heard it over here. Uh, you know, there's, there's, we need to be much more mindful, uh, particularly given the amount of um, technology that's available to us. So you'll be hearing more about some of our strategies around communicating and certainly right now about communicating is Upon us is you know some of the master planning and visioning work that that I talked about earlier. Yeah, so. I, I'd reiterate that that this particular uh, policy will be very important uh, as you proceed with the with the master visioning planning. master planning yeah. process to definitely get the community involved. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. So with that, um, reasonable interpretation. Yes. Yeah. Adequate data. In compliance? Yes. All right. 2.3, we'll sign off on that. Right. I don't know if I have that in the binder or not, but we up there. All right, we'll move on to 2.1, treatment of parents and guardians. So this one is, this is, um, this is in front of you out of sequence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a good policy governance uh, rehearsal question, I think, but, um, Typically, we have our schedule, and when there's a violation um, that that I note, right, or that I am, that I am aware of, obviously I'm going to report that in the next monitoring report. In this case, um, there was what I'm going to say I, a failure to recognize a violation, and so the the recognition of the violation came from someone other than me, and I think it's appropriate that in this in that instance then it comes before you but not as a whole monitoring report but just citing the violation mm -hmm. so these would these are the areas that i'm i'm informing you that were violated and some actions to take to correct it and that you'll see it again when, at the same at the cycle that it was initially planned for i haven't really had the chance i've asked a couple questions to some of the policy governance folks um, at VSBA and I haven't really gotten a, a definitive answer uh, basically it seems to make sense but I was hoping for a little bit more of uh, definition around what do you do when mm -hmm. um, so um, what I've cited in here uh, are the areas that I believe were violated and the detail policies three four five uh, and eight um, particular to the situation uh, that came uh, in front of me again um, dealing with it in, in a way, still responding to the situation, but not recognizing the need to look to policy. And, and you know, do we have a policy? This is some of our guiding questions. You know, is, was there a violation? Again, part of my learning is to make sure, along with my staff, is with any question, is do we have a policy on this and where and how? And so what I've identified in red on page one of six are the areas of the policies that were violated. Um, and then um, again highlighted uh, um, that throughout and on the cover page basically indicated my plan to come into compliance with this policy on those that were violated were the following bulleted items and do you have a copy of that for us? I don't know if we do um, extra copies so so just to, to as a reminder Mm -hmm. The violations you're talking about, and, and just for the public, yep. are violations that were taken up uh, in executive session because they had to do with uh, St a student, student matter. Student mm -hmm. matter and, and so there's not details of what That's those correct. violations are. To, to, to talk specifically about a student matter would be but a the board, violation. But the board has been informed of what those violations were. That's right, Mark. Um, 
Can we just ask, can I just ask a policy governance question then? If you're going to um, report a violation, is that going to happen anytime there's a violation of any mo policy? No. no. So my, my, my thinking mm -hmm. is this, is that when there are violations that happen, they're, they're going to come, and I and, and my staff, we recognize where the violations are. They're going to be within the monitoring reports at the scheduled time, and you should see those and, and, and the evidence associated. In this case, I didn't feel it was right just to wait, right? Um, and again, part of this, we've had some conversation, Elizabeth and I, also about this. So since it wasn't recognized by me or my staff, then there's a heightened concern that, you know, okay. We're not, and so I think it's right and just to bring it back to say there was a violation, but I don't want to have every time we have a violation to redo the whole monitoring report. Otherwise, we could be doing monitor. I mean, I hope not, but we could be. Yeah, I mean, there's a judgment call right. depending okay. on how big of a deal it is. Yeah. That's right. And and the the, I think the recommendations you've made, David, specific to, um, the remedy are largely. Um, will also address the issue of whether this was identified as a policy violation at the administrative level. Right. So it really was a, a, it's a bit of an education and training process on this policy mm -hmm. and, and perhaps others when you have the opportunity to update staff. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The, the training continues, to, you know, not just for me, but these are key questions that need mm -hmm. to be asked of the administrators and for them to be continuing to learn also um, and use the policy governance models. Um, I did have just one other comment with respect to the rest of the, uh, the monitoring report itself. I don't think it, <clears throat> unless, unless these were intentional changes from when we saw the monitoring report and the April, April 2nd mm -hmm. version, uh, there were some changes from that monitoring report. And you may just want, I mean, I can, show you where they are you don't have to go into it very deeply but but for instance one of uh, detail policy number four uh, what you provided us here on the fourth April the, the final April 2nd one had somewhat different language and I think that sure. what you attach to this is older. a little bit of an older version okay. than what we finally came to agreement on on Oh, oh, it should so, not. It should. It should be the the last one that right. we did. And I'll, I'll check where. I'm. I, I can and I can give you because I flagged. Sure. I things. flagged where the uh, those changes are. Thank you. Next, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna take My two, question on this, David, is if you've highlighted, yeah. if you've highlighted these four policies in red, mm -hmm. but you're reporting compliance on several of them in the back. Well, I didn't. I'm not really reporting compliance. I'm reporting those violations because I'm not redoing the whole report. He's not, we're not saying. So we're not reviewing the whole report. No, you're just. Okay. I'm letting you know there's a violation of these policies. What I intend to do to correct, okay. so that when. So we're not going to do a sign off like no. we would. Okay, that was one of my right. next question. No. Okay, so you really you're not using this to report either a new non-compliance right. or compliance. Okay. I mean, I think it's going to be important for you. I'll need to rec I'll need to include in my monitoring report upcoming that this so occurred. So you include that as a violation even though you fixed it at that point in time? I'm not sure how, I mean, I, I need to think that through, but I need to, I, I don't want to, this isn't, this shouldn't go away, right? The, these were violations and these remedies should be then incorporated, I think, into the new monitoring right. report when it comes in front. We can, uh, why we don't we put this down as one of the things we want to talk <laughs> to Howard Frank. We need to get yeah, advice about that. Frank. Harry. 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 Frank. Frank yeah. uh, about when we have our training yeah. session. Yeah. Just Definitely. how to approach this kind of situation. Very good. Get the expert involved. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we'll move on to, um, we've modified agenda item 12 to talk about teacher contract update. And I think I can give a quick update here, uh, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a series of a, at least six face-to-face -face negotiation sessions which have been held between the school board and the South Burlington Educators Association, which began back in December of 2013. Um, 
we did declare impasse on April 7th of this year and have subsequently participated in both a mediation session as well as a fact-finding session. And a fact-finding report was issued last week. Um, and at this point, the board uh, is willing to meet with the association at its earliest convenience and have directed our council actually this evening to extend that invitation to discuss resolution of the contract as soon as possible. Uh, so that's the status of where we're at right now. And uh, we're looking forward to a response back from the association on a, on a meeting date in the near future. All right. Before we go on, I would, and before I forget about it, <laughs> uh, I think we missed an opportunity when uh, Ms. Kettner was here to express what I think has been a very creative and effective approach to the nutrition services mm -hmm. thing. Certainly pleasant to not have to face uh, a deficit, <laughs> at least in the current year. I understand there are lots of challenges to come, but uh, I'm sorry that she's left already, but I did want to make sure that that I, I think we should be commending her for the for the effort for the year. I think it was a, it's at least as good as we'd hoped for, <laughs> mm -hmm. and better perhaps than I think some of us expected. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think that's great. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Well, we'll uh, David, if you wouldn't mind sure. passing that on to Rhonda, I I okay. would concur with you, Dan. I mean, I think. Um, one, the reports, the, the regular updates, which I know, John, you've uh, been very um, instrumental in yeah, helping Rhonda with. I think with, the collaboration between have been the business instrumental. office and yeah. the nutrition services. And I do really think, um, you know, again, we, we recognize it's, uh, it could go either way, um, mm -hmm. but the fact that um, there's that level of attention to detail and the diligence within Rhonda's team um, is really evident in the results. So. Um, I, uh, thank you, Dan, for pointing that out. But please pass on our, our thanks again and, mm -hmm. um, and appreciation of her hard work. Will do. All right, we'll move Not only on. hard, but effective. <laughs> effective, yeah. It's, it's nice when a plan comes together. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to agenda item 13, setting the agenda for what we August anticipate 27th. being the August 27th Correct. meeting. Mm -hmm. So we've added in here, the, in addition to the, our now ongoing city school collaboration, we've added in, mm -hmm. and I hope that's fine, we'll continue to report out on master planning and the financial stewardship discussion um, has been added in there. Are we, I don't know if you distinguish visioning, but do you, are you dropping that or do you want to? No, I, I think we should stay consistent right now. Okay. There is some talk about, I don't know the right word, branding or some sort of okay. conversations about what we might call it. But um, we've been pretty consistent, I think, as a uh, district board around master planning and visioning. So okay. you're, that's a good catch. We should keep the same wording to not confuse the reader. Okay. Uh, you won't need um, uh, 3.2. Okay. Do we need to add, oh, and 2.3? And you won't need okay. that either. Do we need to add back the? Um, uh, yes, the okay. private paying tuition. Private paying tuition. Yeah, why don't we? We'll, we'll add. It certainly needs to be added to future items, future agenda items, so it's not lost. But we ought to put it back in there um, on the agenda as was planned. Yeah. And also, I think didn't you want to add in the administrator's contract ratification? Yes, mm -hmm. and we'll hope to have that. Yep. And Aren't we supposed to have a treatment of staff the second meeting of August according to our work plan for the year? I did not bring my big sheet with me. Uh, big sheet yeah. That you gave okay. us. yeah. Is it on there? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's 2.2 2 treatment of staff. 2.2. 2. So this is the beginning of us doing all this together during a meeting. Everybody still mm -hmm. game for that? Yes, Those we are. Those nice suggestions, okay. Lindsay, yes. Yeah. Just asking. So we'll add 2.2 .2 under Executive Limitations Policy Monitoring. Yeah. So we are getting fundraising on the next update. Mm-hmm. And 
Which ones? Administrative reports. Um, not necessarily. Okay. I mean, again, as you know, there's some folks that are directly in that. Okay. So that's currently what's on the, what's on the. There's some pretty lengthy discussions in there. We may, again, I, fundraising is an important one. So is an hour enough? That's what I'm saying. I, I think so, um, particularly if you have information ahead of time. Um, so should we? Uh, is the schools out program just um, a report? Because it seems like we've had. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, in-person reports a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. It was important to you, though. To we there, there's some issues that yeah. need, need okay. expansion and okay. conversation stuff. Right. We want to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not nothing. Nothing bad. I mean, right. it's, but just need to. It's when you say financial stuff, it's like. You know, the board goes to the negative, the, negative, there negative. Was a negative big, when right? The, when the business manager said, "There's some issues." Yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good problem to yeah, have. That's exactly right. right. Okay, so we're adding back private paying tuition, SBAA ratification, hopefully, um, 2.2 on the monitoring report. Mm -hmm. And I think. And we've added, what did we take off? Um, we've taken off 3.2 and 2.3, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 2.2 is going to be a little bit of time, Meg, as you're doing time, because if we're all doing it together, it's going to be. Well, it's not necessarily the case. I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> Got to beat the 30 minutes. Yeah. Or, yeah. or Julie will be doing that. I told you so. Yeah. All right. Um, future agenda items. Um, the, one of the ones that we're going to get some information on, which I'll have probably soon, because um, I've asked the city on the municipal planning grant. This was the one that was done with Burlington. Mm -hmm. It's particular uh, and connected to the master planning and visioning work which is part of the Chamberlain School District area yeah. around the airport. So that's going to start in the fall. We're soon to get some some more information about the meeting cycle and who needs to be involved, et cetera. So okay. um, that one can probably come off soon. So can we take off master planning now because it will start showing up? Mm -hmm. Master planning and visioning, it's fine. We'll keep it on our... And we can take fundraising off because it's on the next agenda? Mm -hmm. Any comments? Anything should be added here? We're, we're a little, Megan and I were discussing the um, private pay tuition. Is that an agenda item or a future item? It would be an agenda. Uh, it was an agenda item on this, John. So yes. um, we'll, we'll need to evaluate the agenda again based on mm -hmm. some of the times. But the, the idea was to have it on there. Even an update to the board would be an agenda item, okay. private paying tuition. Okay. Diane, can I point out that two things came out? It's great. Future agenda. Items. Good job. And nothing got added. <laughs> Excellent. All right, we'll move on to considering the uh, minutes of the July 9th meeting. Any comments, questions? You to change um, Matt McNeil's name is spelled oh, wrong. Oh, uh, nice catch. It's M A C N E I L. That attention to detail. All right, so, with that modification by consensus, those minutes are approved. And we'll move on to agenda item 16 the lease resolution for computers and vehicles. Mm -hmm. John, you want to just. Touch yes. on that for the board. When um, we go into a lease, the, there's always two board actions. One, because back on July 9th, the issue was should we accept the terms? And number two is to go through a legal review and a credit check mm -hmm. from the lease company on us and then um, uh, go ahead with the lease after those things have happened. So the credit review is done by SunTrust for us. Um, the contract has been given to Steve Stitzel to review, and this resolution came with it. So we will get funding in a few days after this passes, and Steve can issue a legal opinion then. So that's that's why you see two actions there. So do year. we need the resolution before he issues a legal opinion? Yeah, because part of his legal opinion says that the board adopted 
a resolution on so and so date to enter into this agreement. And he's ready to do this. Yes, he is. Okay. Yeah. So is section two consistent with our policy that this is saying the superintendent of the lessee and any other officer who shall have power to execute contracts? Well, I would say yes, because of, of David has the authority to do that under limitations. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've gone through those limitations. We've gone through the bid process for the buses, uh, vehicles, et cetera. We've, um, so that's part of it. Secondly, um, he's basically the signer on, on this document. And when we request funds, when the buses come in, for instance, we have to request funds, then David executes that. You know, he, he signs. It doesn't we, have to we've be. We've approved all requests that will be subject to the Absolutely, state, already. As far as individual uh, bids and That's right. So there's nothing that, there wasn't a reason to call out that it was computers and buses on here specifically? Well, part of the whole lease agreement, it does. The resolution, the does resolution not. does okay. not. So there's, yes, there's schedules that go with the whole contract. So do I have a motion to approve the resolution uh, to adopt the lease resolution for computers and vehicles as proposed by administration? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Okay. All right. Agenda item 17, we have consent agenda of a couple of new hires, a leave of absence, and a bid for non-carbonated beverages. So we will take the leave of absence off the consent agenda. And we have two new hires and a, uh, a bid for the non-carbonated beverages. Do I have a motion to approve those? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And those are approved. Want a discussion on the leave? I'd just like some, some clarification. David, I remember last year we had a similar discussion around someone wanting to take a leave of absence and the board requested that we have some tightening of procedures and, and more strict limitations. So I wondered what has happened in the interim period of time and if you could just yeah, update us on policy really, I guess, or procedure. I mean, th these are, um, you know, anytime there's a human resource related situation like this, there's obviously a lot more into the into the story than, mm -hmm. than not. I mean, first and foremost, late decisions like this are, are, are difficult. Part of our contract, which is positive around our procedures and policy governed under the contract, is that anybody who is in a leave situation um, who comes on board is in a one year only contract anyway. Um, I think the other part of this is can we find a suitable replacement is also part of the process or procedure. And these are questions that I don't necessarily, I delegate that to, in this case, the special educator uh, who's in charge and that's Joanne Godak. And so uh, these are disruptive. Um, we also spend an awful lot of time in training. Uh, that said, our hope is, is that this individual return. And so it's in our best interest, given the, the resources uh, the, the situation, it's our hope and our belief that this person will return uh, given this, this particular situation. And so that's why essentially I, I am recommending. Now can I with 100% assurance say that everyone who does this will come back? Mm -hmm. No. Um, but obviously the situation at hand is uh, the person that fills it, we do believe we can find uh, somebody. Um, we do think that the services will be rendered appropriately, and we do hope that the person, in this case, returns uh, because we put a lot of, uh, and she's given a lot too, a lot of resources into training and profession development. So, um, again, I think any time there is a leave of request, uh, and in some cases there's some that ask, have asked in the past, not, I don't think on any of this board's past, the sabbatical leave, mm -hmm. um, and I don't believe that's ever been approved. 
but that we have uh, for these particular circumstances approved these. So again, I, that's why it's on there. It is disruptive, um, but it is my hope that this person return and um, the person that fills it's gonna be a one year position anyway, based on the, the higher date, so. Do I, any other questions? I guess not. Do you have a motion to approve the leave as proposed by administration? So moved. A second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Did you abstain, Thanks, Julie? I abstain. One abstain. Okay. Elizabeth? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just go back and ask a question about the 2.1 thing again, briefly? Um, I'm thinking that if that were a private matter, you would have discussed that in executive session prior to this meeting. Is that true? Yes. Okay, so then I'm feeling a little bit like that was an attempt to sweep it under the rug as we didn't get any information on that in our packet in the public here, and we didn't get any details as to what the violations were as we have in the past when there have been violations of procedures or protocols. So I guess I'm looking for a little information there. Yeah, it's a good question, and I think respectfully, we've kind of put some of this in our board policy governance training bucket around how best to do this. Mm -hmm. So my, my initial response would be that when this comes up in the monitoring, when we cite evidence, um, we'll need to be, I'll need to be smart around how I indicate evidence around what the violation was without violating, uh, you know, st a student privacy matter. So I, I'll be able to be a little bit more specific I think around what the violation or the evidence was in the violation, and then the corrective action. When it comes up for review, again, right? But not prior. To but again, I, I do want to be be sensitive to you know this is a, you know how we have just done this is has been different, right? Around the violation and how we uh, do this in the future, I think, is part of what we want some, some help with. So. Um, we're not wanting to keep it, it's it, again actually quite transparent that there was a violation well ahead of the actual monitoring report coming due. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, um, I'm speaking on some due diligence around us saying, I didn't catch this. This was a violation that was caught by others. I'm wanting to let you all know that there was a violation. I understand that, but it just seemed that if yep. there were a private matter, it would have been discussed privately. You know, if, if there yep. were FERPA rule, rules, then you would have discussed it in executive session yeah. so that leads me to believe that maybe mm -hmm. I don't know I guess it makes me feel like there's not transparency here right but the other I side understand. would be if it was always in executive session and never came out right. to recognize a policy violation then that would really feel right to, to, to our point that we aren't being you know, uh, our pr processes aren't evolving. And I think well, that's what we're trying to. It seems to me that when, when it comes back, and maybe you are already alluding to this, that you should see how much you can explain anyway, the violation yeah. without delving into the privacy. Right. There may be more detail that I can than get. we've <laughs> been provided tonight yeah. that, that yeah. would be fine without violating exactly the right. privacy. Okay. Yeah, the, the remedy, Kathy, that we kind of came up with to be responsive was to accelerate re-review of the policy and report the violation, have David report the violation in the context of the, the detail policy side of it mm -hmm. so that at least we're going on record, we're um, acknowledging the violation and and David is putting together a, a remedial plan to um, to eliminate that, the opportunity for that violation on a going forward basis without, while maintaining privacy um, of, of individuals involved, so. And I think the other, the, what I said before is we also need some guidance on when there's a violation. Currently, our monitoring reports come up on a cycle, uh, a prescribed mm -hmm. cycle. Um, and so a violation could have happened at the very beginning of the cycle yeah. and only been reported at the time. But those are things that, that myself or my staff are recognizing. This was an outside recognition of a violation, and, and that's what brought it earlier. That's kind of what we think is appropriate, but we'll, we'll need to ask that, mm -hmm. you know. I understand that. However, also, what has been violated does not violate privacy, you know what I mean? If you were That's to say right. what the violation was, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be... Appropriate either. No, I don't think that that, it's, that's not harming any individual. 
I, I think that's where we don't. You're not sure. We're not sure because <laughs> because it, it would be like disclosing information that may be applicable to a small group of individuals. That it's could the be same. Way, yeah, it's the same way we can't disclose information on subsets of our student population where there isn't enough statistical sample that it would be blinded by disclosing it, for instance. Okay. So I, I do think the board's recognized, we, we actually had an opportunity with this to test out a number of venues, which is also the complaint resolution process. And, uh, you know, um, it's not often that we are asked to test that, but I do think um, that worked very well in this process. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of learning, but we are um, looking to the VSBA and, and uh, testing out the policy governance process um, with this particular issue to, to understand um, when a violation occurs outside the scope of the normal monitoring review, and where it originates, and, and how the response might be different. So I we're, we're learning. That just looks different from how um, it's looked in the past, so yeah. I, I had to ask. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we Excellent. think we recognized it as different. Okay. Thanks for the All right. Thank observation. All right, uh, agenda item 18, um, any comments or questions on AP orders two, three, and four? I think there were some questions that were answered in the packet. Mm -hmm. All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Um, Martin, do you have some results of the self-evaluation? Um, As for the, the board didn't have any disagrees, so I won't give us any detail on, on uh, the board of value, meeting evaluation uh, points or on the superintendent feedback uh, points. So apparently it was a top-notch meeting back there on the 9th of July. Um, and you can tell it was even a better meeting from the two comments we got from, from the audience. One uh, from one of our audience members said the meeting was very uh, respectful, efficiently run, and thorough. We will invite that person back to more meetings. <laughs> I especially, she also said, I especially appreciated the chair's <laughs> questioning of current practices, such as having municipal leasing consultants. I can't read the writing. <laughs> Any event, all right, so appreciated your she, thoroughness. She? Oh, did I say she? The audience member. <laughs> will invite back whenever her children are out of town. Um, and the other one is uh, from somebody else who said, thank you for the compassionate, respectful approach that you model. And uh, somebody else noted to her on the way out that we have sharp people on our school board. So it's not nice. Anyway, that is it. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if uh, my colleagues would agree, but it does feel a little out of sync to be getting that feedback. So, yeah, maybe. I suppose mm. that's true. Well, I fact. won't uh, do that to you again. I'll bring it right away. All right, we may want to go back to our regular feedback. Yes, I think that would probably be better. All right, um, unless there's any other questions or comments, David, I will like, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Right. And we are adjourned. Okay.